to the glory of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Well, the psychiatrist Sigmund Freud famously mocked religion, and really specifically Judaism and Christianity, as illusions. He said they were hoping in wishes, very childlike. And the strength of people's conviction and the faith that they held was, according to Freud, a sign of just how strong their wishes were. And so the more they wanted something to be true, the more they wished for it, and the stronger they held on to it with faith and hope. And he said, you know, in a world filled with just forces of nature, like earthquakes and tsunami, or in a world filled with what we would call sin, but he said, people who will wrong you like tyrants, people wanted a God to save them, to make everything okay. And so they invented it, and they've been wishing in it ever since. Well, here's the thing. That's not really what Christians mean when we use the word hope. We use hope in a totally different way. Now, I understand why Freud thought what he thought, um, but it's a very uh, simplistic understanding of what hope is. It's, he thought it was just saying you wanted something and you just say it, and it's going to happen. You know, as if I said, you know what? I'm imagining my, my dining room table right now, and there's a slowly cooked prime rib on it, and grilled asparagus, and onion rings, and chocolate mousse. <laughs> and all of my children are going to take long naps today at the same time. Yeah, bada bing, bada boom. It's real. I'm hoping in it. Our faith isn't a genie in a bottle. Our hope isn't about a genie in a bottle. So what do we mean? What do we mean when we say we have hope? In Jesus. We have hope in the gospel. When we say things like one day we'll be in heaven, what's that based on? Revelation gives us a good starting point for that question, especially Revelation 21 that we read this week and Revelation 22 that will end in next week as we've been reading through this whole book through Easter. As Christians, we can first of all say that our hope is anchored in the Bible. Our hope is anchored in the Bible. And today's reading from Revelation gives us this image of beauty, of peace that Jesus promises in the gospel reading, of salvation. Don't you love that image? The tree whose leaves are meant to heal the nations. My goodness, do we need those leaves Right? Eternal life from a tree of life that bears different fruit every season, forever and ever, our needs entirely met. And isn't it great that it's not just one fruit that's in season all the time? Now, every season has a different fruit with this creativity and abundance beyond what we could hope for and imagine and expect. And so when the Bible uses the word hope, especially the, the he, there's a couple different Hebrew words for hope sprinkled throughout the Old Testament. Every time we see those, it specifically means waiting with expectation. So waiting and fully expecting what we're waiting for to come. And biblical waiting is always on the Lord, first and foremost, not on certain circumstances, but on the Lord, on a person, which makes it very different from kind of a Pollyanna optimism that everything will just be okay. Right? It's actually waiting on the Lord despite the fact that as we look around, we don't physically see him and everything really doesn't seem okay today, but we have hope. And biblical hope always looks back in history to how God has been faithful before. Right, so it's rooted, not as Freud would say, in some imagining of a fantastic future that there's no reason to actually think will ever come, but it's saying, no, God has actually been in human history throughout Israel, before Israel even, in the New Testament, in the world 
since Jesus ascended into heaven through the Holy Spirit. And so we have plenty of good reason to hope. And so our hope is rooted in the Bible, but not as a mythology, not as a philosophy, but as a telling of history and a revelation of what we can hope is to come that we see in Revelation 21. Now, properly understood, then, hope, like love, is not an emotion. There might be emotions that come with it sometimes of peace, but hope is a virtue in the great tradition. And a virtue is a practice, an action, a behavior that we're meant to habituate, to make a habit. And St. Thomas Aquinas, wonderful teacher, reminds us that hope is a theological virtue. Right? The New Testament gives us the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. There are virtues that, that we can make habits without the Holy Spirit, right? Courage, prudence. We see these in, in the ancient Greek philosophy, people making these as habits. But the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love cannot be made habits without the grace of the Holy Spirit that we receive in baptism. We say that they're infused into us. They're given into us and they permeate our being because they've been given to us by God. And it's the only way that we can make them habits, practices that we can live out every day. And hope is a virtue of the already and not yet. Right? That classic statement of where we find ourselves in world history. The already and the not yet. Jesus did come. He has not yet come back. And so we're waiting, persevering, and expecting with good reason, that he will come back and not just kind of walk in the room. I mean, what an image we get in Revelation today. So we become people who can hope through our baptism, and then by living it out, we become hopeful people. It becomes a quality we have. And as hopeful people, it's easier, it's more instinctive to hope. And it's like an upward spiral of growing in holiness. And so we can choose to hope. And if we're trying to figure out, how, you know, when, how do I look at my life and choose to hope? How do I live out hope? Well, it can be helpful to look at avoiding two sins against the virtue of hope. Despair and presumption are the two classical sins against hope. We despair when we look at the world and all its brokenness all around us, and we have no hope that God is actually going to do anything about it. It's just too broken. It's like Humpty Dumpty. It can't be put back together. Or if God could, I don't think he's going to. And that's so easy to do. I mean, we live in a world that makes despair easy. You look at, at the papers from this week, or your iPad, if that's where you get your news, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is dragging on. Right? COVID deaths have passed a million in the U.S. alone. A lot of Americans are reeling after the shooting that was in Buffalo last weekend. There's voices filling our streets, insisting that killing the unborn is a civil right for some. Right? We, and we get caught up in this. We can despair in this. And what we can do is we can actually make a habit of being angry and despairing. That we can become our instinct. And I think good evidence of that is the fact that salmonella and baby formula is apparently political. Right? That is a symptom of habituating frustration and anger and despair. We look for it. It becomes our instinct. It becomes a quality that's about us. So we lose hope when we think of God as somewhere far away in heaven, disconnected from everything that's going on down here. Heaven and earth are just miles apart, nothing to connect them in between. And that's why Isidore of Seville said that despair is to descend into hell. It's to lose any hope in salvation. Right, but our reading in Revelation today gives us a striking image. We have the fulfillment of God's promises of a new Jerusalem, a city, a community where God dwells with humanity. 
and where heaven comes back down to earth. So the promise isn't that we'll all be teleported out of the morass of this world into some ethereal space of heaven, but actually that there'll be a resurrection. Our bodies will resurrect. God will make a new earth. Creation will be beautiful and pure again, and heaven will come down to that new earth and fill it with glory and beauty and peace and things that we can't even begin to imagine. That's the promise that we have hope in. That's the the promise that we're waiting on with expectation. So we're not just optimistic about a future claim. We know from human history that God has done things from greater than our imagining. That's what this whole Easter season is celebrating. And because of that history, we have uh, reason to hope in the future of human history. Now, in addition to despair, there's this other sin of presumption. And this is more subtle. I think it's easier to fall into. The sin of presumption also sees heaven and earth as disconnected or miles apart, but in a different way. It ignores that we're all pilgrims just on a journey toward that heavenly city. Right, so we're just here, right? And, and the image in Revelation, sure, it's going to come one day, but it doesn't have any connection to daily night life now. And so life in the world today doesn't matter a whole heck of a lot. Uh, you're, you're supposed to get saved, believe in Jesus. Then we're kind of in this waiting room, holding pattern. What do we do? I don't know, make the best out of it. What do you do in a waiting room? Hope the magazines are halfway decent. And then one day, finally, they'll call our name back right? What a horrible view of the Christian life and of Christ working in the world. But that is the the kind of easy to fall in to sin of presumption, this disconnect from heaven and earth, right? We forget in that that we don't just get all of God's grace in the bag at our baptism and it's done. And we presume that God's work isn't actually ongoing, And that we have a call to grow and mature in holiness, in hope, among other things. So the great risk here for us that the prayer book tells us about is that we can risk coming to the sacraments, which are deeply sacred means of grace, and receive them kind of like without thinking about the actual details of our daily life, without repenting from our sin. Sure, I'm sinful. Thank God for Easter. Jesus forgave me but I don't actually do the work of taking stock of myself, of working to allow God to grow me in holiness lifelong, of changing, of being transformed into a Christ-like person. That's the promise. John Briggs, who many of you know, uh, helps with our, our catechesis new members class for people coming to confirmation. He has this great image of the old Alfred Hitchcock hour where you had the, the silhouette, right? And then Alfred Hitchcock kind of like fills into it. And it's a great image, actually, of what we're called to do. We have the Christ-like silhouette. But we're not just called to say, oh, yeah, I believe in that. <laughs> it's a thing out there somewhere. We're called to step into it, to allow it to shape us into new people, right? But presumption kind of says, I don't need that. It's nice that it's there. And one day, they'll call our name back out of the waiting room. Our Ash Wednesday litany that we pray every, every year puts this really, um, it, it's sobering and something I think we can all hold on to. We ask for forgiveness of God for our presumption and abuse of God's means of grace, which is chiefly the sacraments and then all the other ways that God ministers grace to us. Lord, have mercy on us for we've sinned against you. So another place where we can come to the sacraments especially the Eucharist, thinking about our our sinfulness and repenting. Okay, so that's hope. And that can sound a little bit theoretical and and academic. How do we put this into practice? Because hope is is a practice. It's a spiritual discipline that we live out. Well, I think, again, that we can look at our lives and say, okay, am I one of those people that's more prone to despair or prone to presumption? Because we each probably have one of those extremes we we kind of generally fall towards. So which of them do I see myself actually kind of being pulled towards? 
if you're prone to despair, then you're probably a deeply sympathetic person, first off, which is not a bad thing. Pull out Revelation 21 when you're reading the newspaper or scrolling through your newsfeed on your favorite device. I won't endorse any particular one, but you've probably got one. Bring out your Bible. Open Revelation 21 that we just read and allow the news of a broken world to push you into the promises of God. Right? Allow the brokenness of the world to be, be a force that pushes you not into despair, but into the promises of God, so that your heart then, from that sympathy, longs after those promises, looks for places where those promises are already being realized, hopes and waits with expectation for those promises when your heart breaks over the world. Right? And allow the rest of the biblical story to bolster that hope with confidence in all the ways that God has been faithful and given us good reason to hope. I loved the first thing one of our kids said was, when did God come down to earth? Christmas! Yes, allow the joy of Christmas to bolster hope in you, just like a little kid at Christmas. And then allow that to to guide you in living as a pilgrim, right? In this community that's journeying together towards this new Jerusalem in hope. Now, if you're prone to presumption, perhaps pause and consider this great uh, line that a teenager who was coming forward uh, last year here at St. Charles for confirmation said to me. I said, what do you think that um, a public profession of faith is? You know, what's that mean to you? And he thought, and he said, I think it, it means this is the path I'm choosing to walk down the rest of my life. Yes! That's exactly what it means. It's not just saying this is a list of facts that I believe. This is a list of facts that are going to actually shape how I live and the path that I walk the rest of my life. Right? We are going to walk towards something. That might be financial security. It might be career advancement. It might be a nice and fun and comfortable life. And none of those are like bad things in and of themselves. Some of them might be prudent things to pursue at certain times, but they're not our destiny. Whether they come or go, they don't define us or define if we can have hope or a good life, right? They're actually things that when we have them, they can be tools to use as people of hope, to look at how God is already bringing about restored people and a restored world and healing the nations and calling us to be part of that. Because once we're people of hope, once we're children of God, God invites us to be part of his building his kingdom, building the vision we see in Revelation. Not because he needs our help. It's Revelation 21's coming, (laughs) whether we help him or not. But like a really kind dad, he says, come on, help me with this. And he gives us a hammer or a screwdriver, it says, be a part of what I'm doing, right? Be a part of what I'm doing. Be a part of restoring people. Be a part of bringing grace and peace and healing to people, mercy to the world, a new world order. What an honor, right? Of all the projects, have you ever had a boss who like gave you a really big project or a, a big responsibility and you were like, oh, I didn't know they felt that highly about me, okay. I can take this on. The God of the universe is saying, come with me and help me restore everything to goodness and beauty and justice and total perfection. Okay, I'm on board for that. If there's a mission we're going to spend our lives on, that sounds pretty good. But we stop doing that work if we fall into despair because we don't actually trust the work that's going to do anything because we don't trust God's behind it. And if we fall into presumption, we get kind of distracted from the work, and we kind of rest back, and just kind of are waiting for some dream far in the future. But when we stand in hope, when we walk in hope, we join our Lord in building his kingdom in this world. And that's the kingdom where every tear will be wiped away. Every wound or physical malady will be over, period, 
forever. It won't come back. Every broken relationship will find reconciliation. Joy will be fully realized in everyone's hearts. So God bless you this morning with hope.